Welcome to the Small Giants Fishbowl. This topic is how to bring your purpose to life. In this fishbowl, you will learn from the Purpose Institute's co-founder and chief purposeologist, Haley Rushing, on how to bring the power of your organization's purpose to life in a systematic, meaningful, and sustainable way. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to tell you this is a pretty ambitious uh, presentation in terms of uh, what, what the ground that uh, the small giants community wanted me to cover covered everything from why purpose matters to how do you find it to how do you articulate it and how do you bring it to life which I could give an hour presentation on any one of those and I'm going to try to cover all of it with you guys today so um, we're actually I'm just going to go ahead and dive on in I feel like y'all are probably already true believers. You wouldn't be a part of the small giants community if you weren't already steeped in the principles of purpose. So I'm gonna talk about this section pretty quickly. So when we talk about why purpose, why does purpose matter? There's kind of four things that I want to, I'm gonna focus on. One is the fact that humans need purpose in their life. Two, we know employees thrive on it. Increasingly, society expects it. And we know that the business performance and the results actually support having a purpose at the heart of the company. So I'm gonna dive into each one of these. The first being this fundamental idea that humans need purpose and meaning in their life. I love uh, what Mickey said. I'm just going to call him Mickey for short, who is the founder of kind of this whole flow state of being and, and really examining what it takes for, be for people to be fully engaged and alive in their work. And he said, one cannot lead a life that is truly excellent without feeling that one belongs to something greater and more permanent than oneself. So this desire to contribute to something greater than yourself, we know is fundamentally rewarding for people. There's been a lot of studies that look at the effect of having extrinsic aspirations, which is uh, seeking money, status awards, versus having intrinsic aspirations, the things that internally you feel called to contribute to, things like helping others improve their lives or learning and growing. And when studies have been done, uh, to actually benchmark how having extrinsic aspirations versus intrinsic aspirations affects your life. Um, the results have been pretty conclusive. So essentially the studies that have been done, they ask people in college, they say, tell me what your goals are in life. And so there'll be a group of people that say, well, I want to make this much money. I want to have this job title. I want to be this, have achieved these kind of awards. And there's other people that say, well, I want to make a difference. I want to have deep relationships. I want to know that what I'm doing matters. And what they found when they've gone back and actually talked to people who have met their goals, whatever they were, they met them. They found if you had extrinsic aspirations, you had similar levels of life satisfaction as you had when you were in college. So no net gain at all, even though you had achieved these, these goals. And you also had pretty high levels of anxiety and depression. I don't know how many of you have ever had the experience of achieving something you thought would make you happy <laughs> it was one of those extrinsic aspirations and then getting there and feeling like a sense of emptiness that that didn't actually deliver what you thought it was going to deliver versus people who have intrinsic goals and they meet those they have much higher levels of life satisfaction than they did when they were in college and they have very low levels of anxiety and depression so we know that what you pursue fundamentally affects the well-being that you're going to cultivate in your life we also know that purpose drives employee engagement. Uh, a lot of this work comes from Dan Pink, who I'm sure you're familiar with, who wrote the book Drive, that talks about what we think motivates people and what actually motivates them are very different. That business is still operating under, largely under the delusion that if you give people a big enough carrot, they'll do anything, versus what he found was what people really want to be engaged is they want autonomy, they want mastery and they want purpose. So you can kind of imagine this. I've taken the liberty of playing this out in a sucky job that you might have related to from a previous incarnation or a great job. So a sucky job is one where you feel controlled and micromanaged. You don't feel like you're using your strengths or growing and you feel like your work may be meaningless. A great job is where you feel in control of your day, you're doing something you're great at and you feel like you're getting better at it every day, and you're doing it in the service of something that matters to you. You feel like you're making a positive difference. When you get all three of those, it leads to phenomenal engagement. And as Dan said, the most deeply motivated people, the most productive, the most satisfied, hitch their desires to a cause larger than themselves. 
And again, Gallup has probably done the most exhaustive and extensive studies on employee engagement have cited purpose as one of the key drivers. So they kind of look at there's the base camp, like do you actually have the tools to do your job? Do you feel respected and like your contributions matter? Those kind of table stakes things are met. Then what people want to know is, does the purpose of my company make me feel my job is important? And a lot of times when Gallup's found that they're in the absence of purpose, there can be a massive reduction in engagement. And they've also found Deloitte did a great study that showed that companies with a strong sense of purpose had about 73% of their employee population fully engaged versus those without purpose only had about a quarter. Um, so next, the other thing that's kind of interesting about purpose, increasingly I think society actually expects business to have a higher purpose. Um, people want their brands to be forces for good. It kind of makes me think of that old adage, if you're not part of the solution, you're a part of the problem. The world has so many problems and issues today and there's an expectation that businesses will step up and, and do the right thing. Um, we see 60% of people say doing good should be a part of a brand's DNA. Over half of people say they'll boycott brands based on their position on social or political issues. You've got over half saying brands have more power to solve social ills than governments. I don't know if that's more of a reflection of our lack of confidence in government today or our awareness that companies and especially corporations hold and wield so much power today. But again, this feeling that brands have the wherewithal to step up and make a positive impact if they choose to do so is a really strong belief in the market. And half of people say that they now buy on belief. So again, there's a growing expectation for purpose. And we know purpose drives performance too. So this whole false argument that you are either in business to make money or you're in business to make a difference has been proven by a number of people much smarter than me to be a false um, dichotomy. So we know from early on when Jim Collins wrote Built to Last and he studied the habits of high performing organizations, that those organizations that had a higher purpose and they had core values baked into their culture outperformed the general market 15 to 1 in comparison companies 6 to 1. Now, when companies added the stakeholder model onto that, then you found they would outperform their competitors eight to one. And uh, um, Cotter and Heskett have found a range of, of performance advantages that accrue from having a purpose, like revenue growth, rate of job creation, stock price growth, profit performance, all of those are significantly higher in purpose-driven organizations. And it's not surprising because of the high engagement, the need in the marketplace, uh, and what people do when they believe that what they do matters results in these kinds of uh, outcomes. So that's the, my very first quick overview of why purpose matters. Any lingering doubts or questions about, there's so many other reasons why purpose matters, but I wanted to hit some of the big ones. And before I jump into the next section on discovering purpose, does anybody out there have just any lingering doubts or questions about why purpose matters that you'd want me to take a shot at answering? Looks like everyone is good, Haley. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next section I wanted to talk about is purpose discovery. Uh, how do you find it? Um, uh, what are the kinds of questions you ask? What's the process you go through to get there? I chose this picture because this should be a collective exercise when it's, and I know maybe a lot of you are founders and entrepreneurs, so you have a really strong sense of what the purpose is of your organization maybe already, but the more you can enlist the hearts and minds of your own people and the journey to discovering your purpose, the, the stronger the commitment will be to it on the back end. So first off, I just wanted to say what, when we, talk about core purpose at the most basic level what we're talking about is just the development of a definitive statement about the difference you're trying to make in the world what difference do you want to make in the world why do you exist beyond making money so this is kind of a strange picture but my <laughs> i always tell companies that purpose is an inside out job you can't have somebody else serve your purpose up to you on a silver platter. Uh, I, and I use this metaphor of the, of the little chick hatching from the egg. My daughters, I have daughters that are in elementary school and, and they hatch eggs and they came home and told me, <laughs> told me what they learned that if you actually come and try to help the little chicken out of its egg uh, and crack on it, the little chicken will die. Uh, 
it actually has to be broken by an inside force for life to really begin. And so it is with purpose. Purpose needs to start and you need to build the strength and the resolve and the, and the commitment to breaking out and into a kind of a purposeful world. If it's handed to you from the outside, it's likely to just kind of wither and die. So uh, some of you may know this inscription it's from the Oracle at Delphi. Again, just following up on this theme that when you're thinking about your purpose, it's fundamentally um, has to come from an authentic place. This is a great quote from Warren Bennis. Know thyself was the inscription over the Oracle, and it's still the most difficult task any of us faces. This holds true for individuals as well as companies, but until you truly know yourself, strengths and weaknesses, know what you want to do and why you want to do it, you can't succeed in any but the most superficial sense of the world of the word. So, and sadly, most people don't know what they stand for within the corporate world. There's a question Gallup's been asking companies do and asking people in their organizations, do you know what your company stands for? Pretty Pretty simple question. I know what my company stands for and what makes our brands different from the competitors. Now, if you ask that to a general employee, only a little over a third of them will say, yes, I know what my company stands for. So imagine all those frontline employees that are supposed to be ostensibly champions of the brand and only a third of them know what you actually stand for. So that's a big deficit. I also find that pretty shocking that less than half of managers seem to know what the company stands for or at at the even the highest level 60 percent know what their company stands for so that's a pretty remarkable figure to me too that 40 percent of executives in, in america don't have a strong sense of what it is that they stand for so part of the work of the purpose discovery pro process is to get really clear on what your talents are, what your people are passionate about, what are the principles that you stand for that are gonna be um, driving the way you go to market and do business. And that reports into kind of this quote from Aristotle that informs and guides so much of our work. It's, he just said, where your talents and the needs of the world cross, there lies your purpose. And by talents, really what we mean are, what are the things, I'll show you, well, I'm calling it the purpose Venn diagram. It's kind of the building blocks of purpose. So your talents are really those strengths and passions. Your talents are, what are you built to do? And what do you care to do? And what does the world need you to do? So it's really that intersection. And it's really important to find the intersection of all three, because I might be really passionate about something that the world needs someone to step up and address, but if I don't have the wherewithal or the competencies or the skills to address it in a meaningful way, I probably won't be in business very long. Or conversely, if I'm really great at something, but I don't really have the heart for it, I'm probably not gonna have the resiliency and the resolve to overcome all of the hurdles you will inevitably face in trying to do something impactful and, and it'll peter out. So you really need to find that intersection of, I can do this, I care to do this, and the world needs me to do this. I'm gonna kind of fly through this because I have a feeling most of you probably or may already have really strong purpose statements, but when we're, when we're exploring and diving into a company and asking them to think about their strengths, what are you built to do? These are some of the questions that we use, like why were you originally founded? What do you have the authority in? What's, go back and kind of look at where have you been incredibly successful and what was at the root of that success? Like, what does that tell you about your area of potential greatness? What are you doing when you're at your best? What are your clear competitive advantages? And what do you have the potential to be the best in the world at? You may not be there today, but you've seen little, it's almost like a little embers within the company that give you a good sense that with the right investment and focus, you could potentially be great in this area. When it comes to passion, that is all about the heart of the matter. What is it that you love about the work of your organization? What do you find gratifying and rewarding? Uh, Simon Sinek's new book, it was kind of, it's kind of the field guide or the follow-up guide to start with why. He has so much invested in the question of just figuring out what brings you the most pride. Tell me stories that embody what makes you proud to work here. So figuring out what it is that people light up and are prou most proud of can be a big unlock or a big um, revelation as to what's driving people. And finally, on the meaningful impact front, this is really kind of looking at all of your stakeholders that you serve and figuring out 
what are their needs that you actually have the wherewithal and desire to address and really looking at employees, customers, suppliers, the community, society, humanity, planet, what are all of the, I mean, the world's got no shortage of problems that need to be addressed. So trying to find that, that thing that lights you up that you think you've built something that could, that could make a dent in that problem is, is key. So those are the questions we explore. We try to bring those all together. And usually the purpose will emerge rather naturally when you've uh, done the diligence to, to really investigate each of those questions. Any burning questions about how to discover your purpose before I move to how you actually put pen to paper and write it down? And I know I'm going pretty fast on this, but there'll be some handouts that are given that kind of cover a lot of the, the points that I'm making. So. Hopefully that'll be helpful. You're doing great, Haley. Keep it going. No questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> good, 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 good. Well, I want to, okay, perfect. So the next section is on, so you've done all the work. We get calls a lot with, from companies who have been on this journey for maybe nine months, a year, trying to wrestle their purpose to the ground, but they just can't seem to capture it in those, you know, seven to 10 words that really capture the magic of what they're trying to do. So a couple of like big tips that we've learned over the years in terms of articulating your purpose, set the how aside, stay focused, keep it simple, aim high, but not too high. So let me tell you about each of these. So the first one, set the how aside. You don't wanna encumber your purpose with how you're gonna fulfill it because the how is gonna change and evolve over time. It must change and evolve over time in order to stay relevant in this hyperspeed marketplace that we live in. So you wanna focus on the unchanging motivation of the business. The client that I personally learned so much from having worked with Southwest Airlines for over 20 years, uh, they were my first purpose client. And Herb at one point came to us and he said, I think at this point, people know how we're different. Uh, it's time to tell them what difference we make, or I'm, I'm curious about what difference we actually make. We went out and talked to people. Uh, and what people told us was well, because of Southwest, I have the freedom to fly. I can go and see and do things I, I never thought I could do. So we encaptured, encapsulated the difference that Southwest makes in the purpose statement, giving people the freedom to fly. Now, how Southwest gives people the freedom to fly, certainly when they started out, it was all about low fares. Other times it's been about frequency of flight. You're free because there's another flight 30 minutes from now. Other times it's been about you're free to fly because of our friendly people that we bring humanity back to the skies. Other times it might be around because your bags, bags fly free, you can still fly. So kind of the support pillars to that freedom evolved over the over you know the years in response to what was most compelling in the marketplace so just you want to keep your purpose focused on the ultimate difference the ultimate value and not worry too much about the how that'll come that'll come elsewhere you want to stay focused really get to the heart of what matters most i I love just kind of looking out in the world for potential purpose statements. I was, I was Googling some different hotel purpose statements, and this one came up as a purpose statement for a big hotel chain that I'm sure you've all heard of. And you can see that there was probably great intentions when this was written. And there's a lot of good stuff in here. You know, we succeed when we meet and exceed expectations of our customers. We have a passion for excellence. We have standards of integrity. We celebrate diversity. We honor dignity. Lots of good stuff. But if you have a workforce of hundreds or even thousands of employees, the likelihood that they're going to know what they're there to do is kind of slim when there's that many components to your purpose. Versus hotel chain B, be hospitable. Our purpose is to be hospitable. Like that's something that telepaths and scales everywhere and everyone knows exactly that's what we're here to do. Keep it simple, go for clarity over cleverness or creativity. You know, your purpose is not a tagline. There is a time when your purpose will be translated. It'll go through that beautiful creative process where it does get translated into a tagline, but you don't have to worry about your purpose being super creative. You wanna err on the side of clarity. So it's funny, a lot of times you can, uh, when I, I was working for, doing Walmart's purpose back in 2006, and I had arrived at this purpose statement that I thought was so clever, and it was, you know, had this nice alliteration to improve the quality of life by lowering the cost of living. And while it might be accurate, um, 
believe Scott and Tony Rogers both kind of said, I'm not sure that our 2.4 million associates are all going to understand cost of living, quality of life. Can we, can we just say it like Mr. Sam said it when he was asked about the kind of legacy he wanted to leave? So we we're like, yeah, we can. We can strip it down and just say to save people money and help them live better. And that one, in that case, it actually did end up informing their tagline of save money, live better. So you, I always call this the five-year-old test. Like, can you make it so simple that even a child could understand it? Save people money and help them live better. Also, you want to aim high. So this should be a noble goal that you're capable of achieving when you're at your best. So we did a big project for the American Council on Education, which is the trade association for higher ed. So it had everybody from public schools to trade schools to online colleges to Ivy Leagues. Each in their own way, they are in the business of transforming lives for the betterment of society, one student, one discovery at a time. I don't know if any of you have ever worked in academia, but when we presented that, everyone started interrogating it uh, and investigating it as if it were a white paper. So at one point, we ended up in writing down what we would end up with if they rooted the purpose too much in reality. It would be sometimes we transform lives in a way that might or might not be beneficial. And sometimes we do breakthrough research, but sometimes we don't, but we make a good effort to give students useful skills for operating in the world. So don't worry about, about your purpose feeling like a stretch. It should be a bit of a stretch. It should be who you are when you're at your best, knowing full well that there's gonna be massive gaps. You're not doing that all the time, but you set the intention that this is what we, who we are and what we're trying to do when we're at our best and we can get there. Now I say aim high, but don't end up in the ether. Probably one of the most common mistakes I see with purpose statements is people have aimed so high that you have no idea what they're talking about. To make the world a better place, to change the world for the better, to revolutionize the industry. Mike Judge loves ripping on this in, in uh, Silicon Valley. If any of y'all watch that, it's so funny. But, you know, the, the everyone coming out saying we're here to make the world a better place. It's a wonderful intention. It's beautiful. But you want to have a little bit more specificity in what particular way are you going to make a better place? In what way are you changing the world for the better? So that it's useful for your people. They know, have more of a direct line of sight about we're here to do this particular, this is our role in making the world a better place. So hopefully those tips give you a little bit of uh, help or guidance if you're in the throes of trying to capture the sentence. Any questions or struggles or comments about articulating your purpose? It's also my chance to get a drink. Okay. Well then, anything? No, good. Okay, so let's move on to bringing purpose to life because probably I suspect a lot of you already have your purpose, particularly if you're founders, entrepreneurs, you are kind of born with purpose from day one, uh, probably may or may have gone through the work of already writing a great purpose. And there's always this struggle of now what? Now how do I actually bring it, bring my purpose to life and enculturate it in everything that I do? So the first thing I want to talk about is this concept of mind the gap. So there's always going to be gaps between the aspiration of the purpose and the current reality that you're living in. And there should be. If it was 100% match, you probably didn't push your purpose far enough. So now, so you want to, you want to mind the gap. And the reason you want to do, be mindful of that is, sorry, uh, is because people will respond, we'll talk about this in a minute, with some, if there's too much cognitive dissonance, there's a couple strategies that will happen for people to restore congruency in their mind, which I'll get to in just a second. But I do want to just share this one uh, data point where, you know, at this point, it's been fun as a purposeologist for the last 20 years when we started this work. Most people thought we were a bunch of hippies from Austin preaching purpose and talking, you know, like, a, like that was so idealistic. At this point where we are in 2018, 90% of executives now believe that purpose matters. They look at 
when you ask them about the value of purpose, they, they are aware that theoretically purpose drives employees' satisfaction. It helps with transformation efforts. It improves product quality, customer loyalty, overall pur purpose, I'm sorry, performance. They get it, um, that, that, pur that purpose has the power to drive pretty incredible performance across a variety of measures. But at the same time, less than half are currently running their companies in a purpose-driven way. So their strategies don't necessarily reflect the purpose. The business model and operations aren't aligned with the purpose. Their people don't really understand what it means. Sometimes there's even a disconnect between what the executives and the employees think are the purpose. So there's the, there's the aspiration of purpose and the reality. I don't know how many of y'all have experienced that. But when you're launching purpose in a company, um, and th th you're going to have to deal with any dissonance that may arise. So the point is not to try to um, alleviate it, but to tr be prepared for it. Because when people, when what we believe and what we see don't align, we'll try to reconcile that discrepancy. Human beings don't like incongruency. They'll, they'll try to figure it out. So the prevailing belief that you're up against is that the purpose of business is to maximize profit, maximize profit or to make money. The new belief that you're trying to really infuse into your organization is that the purpose of business is to fulfill a purpose beyond making money, to make a positive difference in the world. So there's three things that kind of happen when you launch this idea. We've got this new purpose. Uh, and, and so here's one thing that can happen. This is kind of the worst case scenario. People will reject new beliefs, a new purpose that don't align with their current beliefs or their view of reality. So you come to the table in front of your employees or your groups that you're managing. You've got this new shiny new purpose that you're excited about. But if you put that up, the current beliefs, what you're putting that up against is that companies only care about profit and performance. That's in their mind. Or they might be looking at the current reality and saying kind of what that data suggested. Well, the business model, the strategies, the operations, the success metrics, none of those things are linked to the purpose. So people are, the leaders are saying purpose, but I don't see anything fundamental in the business, how I'm compensated, how we're structured, uh, what we're doing to support that purpose in a meaningful way. And in that case, people will just, um, bail on the purpose they'll it'll just disappear so that happens unfortunately a lot in very well-intentioned companies that are passionate about the purpose but they don't do the hard work to actually bring the business model and the strategy along with it so the second thing that human beings will do in in the face of dissonance is people and we do this all the time it's one fun little trait of human nature we tend to dismiss contradictory information and seek out confirming evidence we do this a lot in uh, with our political ideologies uh, we do this in people that we choose to love in any number of ways we say this is what i believe and let me show you here x y and z proves that i'm right so this human kind of phenomenon can be used to your advantage when you're using when you're introducing a purpose so if you've got your new purpose what part of what you want to do when you're launching a purpose and it's just this fragile new thing is to be quick to say here's all the evidence uh, that we have that shows we're capable of actually fulfilling this purpose so when you're going through that purpose discovery process and you're asking people about those moments that they were most proud or the strengths of the organization, you're actually collecting stories that are gonna provide the proof to the promise of your purpose. So I, I always encourage kind of story collection that, of the stories of what the company has done that are 100% in alignment with the purpose and then leveraging those as much as you can to get people kind of head nodding. You're essentially trying to get the flywheel going and kind of build up some muscle behind the new purpose. Um, the third strategy is this idea of, okay, people will try to remain steadfast in an aspirational belief while they work very diligently to create a new reality. So, so this is the idea that like we've got a very noble aspirational purpose that we're passionate about and we know there's a massive gap, but we are committed to creating a new reality. And probably one of a, the best, easiest examples to get around this is with Roger Bannister, where he believed it was possible for the human body to run a four minute mile despite 
the fact that no one had ever done it before. Everyone told him he was crazy. It couldn't be done. The human body wasn't made to do that. You know, the medical community was saying it was impossible, but he trained, he believed it was possible. Uh, and he, I love this quote from him. He says, I went on worrying about the first lap time until my knowledge of pace had deserted me. It's kind of like my knowledge of the status quo just disappears. I felt so full of running. My mind seemed almost detached from my body. A four minute lap was possible. So that's the other thing you can do when you have this new purpose that especially when it's particularly bold and disruptive is to say, I, I know, like be brutally honest about the gap that exists between the aspiration and the reality and be prepared to have a game plan for making it a reality. So right on the heels of introducing your purpose, you're saying, here's our strategy to fulfill it. Here's the innovations that are gonna make it possible. Here's the talent we're gonna acquire and how we're gonna manage them so that they're champions of the purpose. Here's new purpose aligned incentives. Essentially get the, get the game plan in place so people can see how to get there. So it's funny, I love uh, Shane Lopez from Gallup wrote a book on hope. And his definition definition of hope is the vision of a better way, a, the vision of a better future, and the wherewithal to get there. The wherewithal to get there is really critical. <laughs> so that's what gives people hope. If you just paint a vision of what's possible, but don't have the game plan for getting there, then you're likely to end up with more despair because you've just shown people a better future that they don't know how to get to. So when when you have the game plan, your purpose can kind of take off. So just to recap, you want to take stock of the incongruence that might exist, use stories to get the flywheel moving, and then develop a game plan to support the purpose in meaningful ways. Um, so I'm going to focus for the next part on how do you actually develop a game plan to support the purpose? Like, what are the, what are the ways that you should be thinking about bringing your purpose to life? Because I get the sense that in this community, that's y'all are probably down the field, like the ball's in play and you're just looking for more ways to, to manifest it. Let me get a drink real quick. And Haley, just uh, a question that came in, came in uh, right after the last section. So how do you deal with people who come back with, we are here to make money or we shouldn't be here from team members, for example. And then the second part is, um, but I don't see my job specifically called out in this purpose. So team members also mm -hmm. mentioning that. Okay. Well, I mean, I think for, for, there are probably half a dozen white papers, which I'm sure the small giants community has, and I'm happy to distribute that show the correlation be, or the causation between having a strong purpose and driving profit and performance. So to the naysayers who say, we're just here to make money. I don't know why you're distracting us with this purpose stuff. There's, case after case after case, study after study that shows by pursuing purpose, profit will follow. And that ironically, those companies that, per, maybe not ironically, but the companies that pursue profit directly actually end up making much less of it. So I feel like that can be addressed through some pretty good logical explanations of the correlation between purpose and performance. And then the, doing a line of sight between your your role and the purpose of the, the higher purpose of the company is pretty key. I would say that one of the groups that's doing some amazing work around that is Aaron Hurst's group at the Imper at Imperative. They do personal purpose work, and they've actually kind of managed to do a scalable personal purpose survey where you take a survey online, and it actually puts you into almost a purpose archetype, um, almost like Myers-Briggs. Like, so it'll tell you, this is your, this is, this is your personal purpose. And now, and now what we're doing is trying to figure out how do you link someone's personal purpose with the organizational purpose? Because that to me is like the holy grail of a purpose-driven organization where everyone knows individually what difference they're compelled to make and they're doing that in the service of the collective purpose of the organization. So it's very hard work. You want everybody to see how what they do contributes to it. Um, and so I would recommend you look at that work because I think the more clarity that people have about their own purpose, then you can start to connect the dots up to the higher purpose. So 
I'm going to go through a couple different points about how, how you should think about using your purpose. The, the first thing, and this is kind of just the 30,000 foot, your purpose should be this, I think of it as an animating force for everything that you do. You want to think of it not as a separate set of activities, like we've got the normal business over here, and then we've got purpose initiatives over here. It really should be a lens that you look at everything that you're doing through. So everything should, every priority, you can look at it and say, is this going to help us fulfill our purpose or not? If it is, then great. Let's make it a bigger priority. If it's not, maybe deprioritize it or take it off the list. Uh, look at what's on your to-do list and say, how could I make this thing right in front of me, this thing I'm supposed to work on next week, an opportunity to fulfill or support the purpose? So that, that I know that sounds super simple, but so many people miss opportunities right under their nose to make it uh, make something another demonstration of the fulfillment of the purpose, um, that that one's key. I'll share some fun examples from that in a second. And then if you're truly committed to filling, fulfilling your purpose, what should be on your to-do list that isn't? So there's going to be some big, some of those gaps between the purpose and the reality that are going to give you direction as to what you should be doing. I'll share probably one of the best examples I have on a company that took their purpose and used it to drive everything that they did or as a filter for everything they did from Southwest Airlines. Again, I shared with you their purpose is giving people the freedom to fly. That was their purpose for 20 years, from 1996 to 2016. That's a pretty good, pretty good run. And I love when people ask Herb about the strategic plan for Southwest. He said, we have a strategic plan. It's called doing things. And, and I think you can say that, when you have a purpose that's clear and everybody knows what their work is supposed to be in the service of. So for Southwest Airlines, for example, everyone in that company knew, knew that they were in the freedom business. And so the first thing we did is we wanted, we wanted the employees to be beneficiaries of freedom in their own right, not just champions of freedom for customers, but they should experience it. So we worked with Libby Sartain, the head of their people department and developed seven employee freedoms. They had the freedom to grow their careers. They had the freedom to fly. They had the freedom to solve problems as they see fit. They had the freedom to bring their personalities to work. So we kind of turned the purpose inward, which I think is a fun exercise that a lot of companies overlook is if you turn your purpose inward on your employee population, what could that look like? Uh, we used it as competitive differentiation. So it's funny, when all of the, the travel industry, cr industry crashed, that's when all the consultants came on and said, you know what, you can add 300 million to your bottom line by charging for bags. And at that time, Gary Kelly was at the helm and he said, you know what, we're not gonna do that because that would trespass against our fundamental promise of giving people the freedom to fly. So uh, we came up with a campaign called Bags Fly Free. And when we did that, which was totally counter to the rest of the industry, we ended up getting a billion dollars in new revenue from people who abandoned their old airlines and switched to Southwest because of the integrity of not charging people bags for their own short-term expedient gains of the airline, but by doing right by the customer. Uh, we used it when it came time to develop for products. In this case, it was the loyalty program. We said, well, What's the biggest problem with loyalty programs? Most people can't use them. There's like a bajillion blackout dates. There's like six seats per plane. They're actually available. So with rapid rewards, we said, we're gonna, we're gonna bake freedom into rapid rewards that you could have 100% of the seats filled with rapid reward redemptions. There's the fewest blackout dates of anything so that people are actually free to use their rewards. So it showed up there. Um, we use it to drive the business strategy, optimizing the load factor. We thought about how can we fill our planes and deliver freedom simultaneously. We created this app called Ding where people download it on their, on their desktops and it tells them when there's a low fare leaving in the next 48 hours to some place they want to go. So it meets the objective of filling the planes. It gives people a, 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 the freedom to go somewhere they were interested in going for next to nothing. Uh, revenue modeling, we're like, look at how can we, how can we play with the revenue a little bit to give people the opportunity to take their friends with them for free and develop the Friends Fly Free program. 
um, we bake it into the nomenclature. So one of the fun things we did is when we put them in the, we said, we're not in the discount airline business, you're in the freedom business. We name people freedom fighters. We talk about liberating markets instead of launching markets. We talk about you're free to sit wherever you want. So that's kind of the spirit of freedom is baked in. And then lastly, we brought it to life in their advertising for 20 years. Ding, you are now free to move about the country. Also in the campaign, want to get away, like tapped into the spirit of freedom. So it should be, I love this example. And this example comes from working with them for 20 years and every project that came up, well, how could this be about freedom? How could we bake it in? How could this be another demonstration? So um, you want to think about, is your purpose driving everything? Well, it should be on your to-do list. How can you look at something that's on your to-do list already as a potential opportunity to fulfill the purpose? You wanna use your purpose to drive your innovation strategy. So, so many people are obviously hyper-concerned about being an innovative company, but innovation for innovation's sake can be uh, a rat race that's not very fulfilling pretty, pretty quickly. So, but innovation in the service of your purpose and using your purpose to, to pull innovation out of the organization can be quite inspiring. Um, we've done a lot of work with Whole Foods uh, and their heart of their purpose is this idea of we embrace our responsibility to co-create a world where each of us, our communities and our planet can flourish. They've been one of the pioneers of purpose, of the multi-stakeholder model of conscious leadership. And so, it was interesting when PETA showed up in an annual meeting one year protesting, saying, Whole Foods, what about the animal community? And with enough um, information and, and awareness, John Mackey said, you're right, we have left the animal community out of the stakeholder model, and we need to address that. And so they set about creating the leading animal welfare standards in the industry. And they didn't just do it for South, for Southwest, for Whole Foods, they put it out for the entire industry because they truly wanted to make a difference in the lives of the animals that are in the industrial food system. And that unleashed all kinds of passion and energy within the organization. Margaret Wittenberg was their head of quality for 20, 30 years. And she talked about, I woke up every day excited to go to work, knowing I'd be bringing PETA together with ranchers, together with the FDA, with Temple Grandin. They brought all the players to the table to radically transform the way we care for animals in our food system. So when you think of innovation at Whole Foods, their purpose was the catalyst for identifying a real need and an opportunity for innovation. And they developed something that's now the industry-wide standard. So is your purpose driving innovation? Are you continually innovating to create a reality that's more in alignment with your purpose? Or could you pick each year like one big audacious problem that you could be focused on solving to kind of, kind of do your moonshot, so to speak? All right, the next area is really, f I love this one, and I've had a lot of experience with retail clients, so which give you a lot more opportunity in some ways to play. But, your purpose, you should be using it to drive pretty extraordinary customer experiences. Um, I'm gonna share with you some of the clients I've worked with. First United is a great small uh, community bank based out of Durant, Oklahoma. And their purpose is to inspire and empower people to spend life wisely. They believe there's material prosperity and that's good and necessary, but a true prosperous life is gonna have four elements to it. A true a life spent well and abundance and well-being is going to have financial well-being. It's going to have physical well-being. It's going to have spiritual well-being. So they have a whole faith component and it's going to involve personal growth and development. And those four pillars really come to life in their lobbies. They're redesigning all of their banking lobbies, which banks need to because nobody who goes to a bank anymore, but they want to be real pillars of the community that are actually um, centers for customers and community members to come together and think about how, how to spend life wisely. So when you walk into their lobbies, you'll find a library that'll have a book of the month on financial well-being, on health and wellness, on personal growth, on faith. And you can just take the book, you can pay for it or just take it and pay it forward to someone else. They have um, all kinds of classes going on in their banks on each one of those pillars, there's probably half a dozen different programs under there that they're engaging their customers around. Um, and 
even even the engage in your community there's there's rooms at the banks that people can use there's coffee mornings with cops there's pet adoption centers there's all kinds of things that they have going on to get people to think more fundamentally and thoughtfully about the people in their community and how to engage, get engaged to spin spin life wisely totally different conception and kind of conversation to be having with your bank um, the next one comes from studio movie grill uh, I actually haven't worked on this one directly, and like most of the other examples in here, but Brian, I've gotten to know the founder. Beautiful purpose, to open hearts and minds one story at a time. And he employed the stakeholder model to really come up with some innovative experiences that Studio Movie Grill enables people to have. So he, he thought about every single one of the stakeholders. So what, what is the community where I operate need? Well. And actually, I'll, I'll say this, this particular experience that was created, I think the catalyst was this movie that came out called The Race to Nowhere. It was an independent documentary that was done. It was, a, it was the subtitle says, The Dark Side of America's Achievement Culture. So it was looked at how standardized, the standardization of American education has really um, created a lot of problems in our education system. And so he used the film as an opportunity to innovate and serve the needs of every stakeholder. So schools need to strengthen relationships with their parents. Parents want to know how to be better parents. Um, the filmmakers need distribution for their films. The employees and the, and the shareholders need um, to create exciting experiences that drive people to the theater on nights that are um, kind of low volume nights or low traffic nights. So collectively, they were able to fulfill their purpose of opening hearts and minds one story at a time, getting people having a deep conversation about the state of our educational system, bringing all these stakeholders together to build community around a shared topic of educating our next generation. So I think it's a, this was a great example of, here's how a purpose informed a customer experience and was made incredibly powerful by using the stakeholder tool to really think about all of the elements that would need to come into play in, that, in designing that experience. Another one comes from ShopRite. I don't know how many people know much about ShopRite. They're actually a co-op. So it's about 200 individually owned grocery stores that all came together uh, under ShopRite in order to have some more buying power. Um, but their purpose is to care deeply about the people in our communities, helping them to eat well and be happy. And one of their owners in particular, uh, Jeff Brown, who opened up shop rights in food deserts in Philadelphia, is just an exemplar of that purpose. So he has created something truly remarkable. Everybody talks about multi-stakeholder models. Um, everybody said, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't build a successful grocery store in the areas of Philadelphia. Uh, no businesses could thrive there, but he included the community in the design of the story. And he asked people, what do you need from a community store? Like, what do you want this to be? And it was everything, the, the learning that came out of that was everything from on-site healthcare clinics, jobs for ex-felons, about 40% of his employees are ex-felons who've gone through training and are able to be employed now. Um, they, grandmothers came in and said, I want to get guns off our streets. So he gave people a gun buyback Car, um, shopping card. If you bring in a gun, you'll get a $100 ShopRite gift certificate to buy food. They needed an entitlement office to help with food programs. They wanted People wanted to walk in and for it to smell and sound and look and taste like my store. So everything from the music to the smells of the kinds of foods that they prefer to, it, it just feels like a store that's reflective of the community. Um, they even think about it, it's interesting. He's, he talked about creating value that has dignity. So typically in a butcher, for example, if you wanted to get a value on a slice of meat, you would just get a really small piece of, they would just cut it really small. But as a mother serving her family, you don't wanna just look like it's a tiny little piece of meat. That doesn't feel very good. So they came up with something called thin slice where you still have a big piece of a big steak on the plate it's just thinner so you get the value proposition that the market needs without stripping any of the dignity of serving like a big full good looking plate of food 
They have dietitians to help with the high incidence of diabetes in that population. They're working with the K through 12 schools to do nutrition education and home ec classes. They're building community gardens. He said when he went there and talked to a lot of the local kids, they'd never seen broccoli before. They'd never seen cauliflower before. Now they're growing it. So every store he has in Philadelphia has a community garden associated with it that the kids get to grow. And then they can sell the produce from those community gardens in ShopRite to fund their school's nonprofit work or school initiatives. So those are, those are just a couple examples of how the purpose became a really uh, it, it just evident in the customer experience. So what would be the most meaningful way to bring your purpose to life for your customers? What would make your purpose so blatantly obvious that you'd never even have to say it? <clears throat> I think great purpose-driven companies, that's one of the best litmus tests. You actually have to spend less in advertising because if you're living your purpose, people will feel it. They'll experience it. You won't have to tell them or spend hundreds of millions of dollars making sure they know what you would supposedly stand for. All right, you want to use it to attract passionate people. So certainly, uh, and Southwest is probably the best at this, and Colleen was really the heart and soul of the culture. She said, don't ever take a job. Join a crusade. Find a cause you can believe in and give yourself to it completely. And so they were very explicit in communicating um, that this was, you're signing up for the flight of your life. It's not just a career, it's a cause. You're giving people the freedom to fly, and we want you to live by our core values of warrior spirit, servant's heart, and fun loving. So the first thing you want to do in building uh, a culture of passionate people around your purpose is explicitly communicate it loud and proud. You want to cultivate it when they get in. So I know you can't read this, but this was a letter from Herb Kelleher to all of the freedom fighters of Southwest Airlines. And as soon as people were onboarded into Southwest, they were given this letter. You see it, everybody that talks about because of you, people have the freedom to fly. They do a lot of work to connect every role in the company back to the purpose. So if I'm loading bags onto a plane, I know that the faster I load the bags onto the plane, the faster the turn times, the more flights we can offer and the more freedom that gives. So to the person's question about do people see their role in connection to the purpose? They do a lot of training to show how every role or function contributes to freedom in some particular way. And then you wanna celebrate it. So they pioneered the culture committee that was really, their exclusive purpose is to recognize, appreciate, and celebrate people who are living the values and fulfilling the purpose. So it's people who are nominated, um, the culture committee, I, I put a little separate slide out because it's so important to identify employees who have responsibility for really championing the purpose and values of the company um, and get them out there finding the people, celebrating people, and uh, recognizing acts, of, acts that are in alignment with the purpose. So my last little section, two slides, and this one I would say is critical in all of Deloitte's studies about why there is that massive gap between what executives know and what they do is, is often it comes down to the metrics haven't changed. And when all you're holding yourself accountable to is short-term results, quarterly earnings, profit, if you never augment or complement those, those measures with more purpose-driven goals, they'll often, it'll never take root. So you want to Think about how do you hold yourself accountable to something nobler than just making money. Establish some real purpose-inspired success criteria that'll let you know that you're fulfilling the purpose. So, so that you need to have a common view of two things. What will we measure to track progress on fulfilling our purpose? And how will our purpose make us more successful? The first one is really the most important. So again, for Southwest, this doesn't have to be rocket science. It's they said, if we're in the freedom business, when we started, 15% of the market had flown and they had a big measuring kind of thing on their wall at their headquarters. Today, it's 96% of the market has flown. They worked with the Department of Transfer Transportation to measure the impact of Southwest entering a market. And it's called the Southwest effect and about 20% more air travel occurs when Southwest enters a market. So that's a good indicator that they're liberating 20% of the market who previously couldn't fly. Walmart, when they talked about saving people money and helping them live better, 
started measuring the cost of living for people who live in a Walmart trade area. And on average, their cost of living is about $2,300 less than if you don't live in a Walmart trade area. So again, a very clear indicator that yes, we're saving people money in a significant, meaningful way. You can think about First United Bank, enabling people to spend life wisely, that they could do some kind of cool, instead of just customer satisfaction, could they come up with like a well-being index that people are growing in their financial, but also their physical, their spiritual, their personal well-being as a result of engaging with that client. So the goal is really to formulate some simple metrics that signal to the organization how you're going to hold yourself accountable to the purpose and have fun coming up with those. I think they're, I think they're uh, kind of, that's one of my favorite things to try to work on. And that is it. And there are three minutes to spare. So I welcome any questions you guys may have. Thank you so much, Haley. That was wonderful. Um, we have a quick question. If you can um, share again the tool uh, and the website for creating your personal or individual purpose in the organization. Well, uh, I would say to check out Imperative is the name of the organization. Aaron Hurst is the founder of that. And I've been told, I have nothing to do with them other than I've gotten the, the um, good fortune of collaborating with, with them on some shared clients. But they have created some really great tools to help people identify their personal purpose. So just look up Imperative Aaron Hurst and you can find out all about helping people discover their personal purpose in the workplace. Okay, great. Uh, and this is another uh, sort of specific question. Um, we'd love your opinion on utilizing net promoter score and purpose-driven values of leadership. Yeah, net promoter score is one of, on the last slide I showed, when, it's, when, when companies want to do purpose, there's, there's purpose metrics that measure how well you're doing on fulfilling your purpose. You also want to say, what do we think purpose is going to do for us? Do we think purpose is going to increase employee engagement? Do we think it's going to drive our net promoter score? Do we think it's going to deepen customer relationships? All of those are fair game. If net promoter score works for you, I, I would definitely use it and look at how it is impacted the more you're living and preaching your purpose. And I would expect you'd see some pretty strong correlation there. Great, great. Uh, another question is any tips on B2B sales? On B2B sales? Uh, it works there too. It's funny, most of my stuff has been in the consumer sector, but, I've done purpose workshops with B2B companies. And certainly there's one, a wonderful woman, Lisa McLeoya, that calls selling with noble purpose. And her work is great. She, she works in the sales space and she's done a lot of studies that show how much more successful sales forces are when they sell, sell with a purpose frame to what they do. So she's, she's an expert in that. I would look up her work. I think it's called Selling with Noble Purpose. Okay, well, that's it for this one. Check out more fishbowls exclusively for the Small Giants community at smallgiants.org.